Exodus 32, first 14 verses, and we've been in Exodus for a while, and we'll probably be there at least one more week. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, Come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses, who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. Aaron answered them, Take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing, and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took what they handed him and made it into an idol cast in the shape of a calf fashioning it with a tool. Then they said, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, Tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. So the next day the people rose up early, rather, and sacrificed burnt offerings and presented fellowship offerings. Afterward, they sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go down, because your people whom you brought up out of Egypt have become corrupt. They have been quick to turn away from what I commanded them and have made themselves an idol, cast in the shape of a calf. They have bowed down to it and sacrificed to it and have said, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. I have seen these people, the Lord said to Moses, and they are a stiff-necked people. Now leave me alone, so that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them. Then I will make you into a great nation. But Moses sought the favor of the Lord his God. Why should the Egyptians say it was with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to wipe them off the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce anger. Relent. And do not bring disaster on your people. Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, to whom you swore by your own self, I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and I will give your descendants all this land I promised them, and it will be their inheritance forever. Then the Lord relented and did not bring on his people the disaster he had threatened. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. For the fact that even now, Lord, I know I'm trusting in help that uh, has to come from you and will come from you. And I'm grateful for that. I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, again, thanks to you who are here. And I hope if uh, you're watching from home, you're able to hear me. Our tech guys have been struggling. And I believe last week we finally got it right. What they wouldn't do for me, they did for Melody. I don't know sure what that tells you about anything. <laughs> But I think we're I think we're online. So if you're at, at home, uh, we're glad you're you're here. I don't know if there are 20 or two watching from the house or 50. I'm just not sure. But we are grateful for your your presence. Well, let's begin verse one, and we'll move through this. Um, Israel has come out of Egypt, and we've gone through this story. You should be familiar with the basic contours of it. And they've, they've approached this mountain, and God, uh, God is going to meet them there. And Moses establishes boundaries before they arrive. He says, you can't just barge in on the presence of the Holy One. It's dangerous. Now, when they get there and see the theophany, the presence of the Lord, the lightning, they, they see the lightning, they hear the thunder, they see the cloud, which demonstrates God's presence, they don't have to be told to stand back. They are scared. And so they do. And Moses is called up to the mountain to have an intimate encounter with God. I believe that Moses was one of the greatest men in history. If you go to your local public schools, they don't know who Moses is, but they should. Uh, what happened on top of that mountain started an intellectual revolution. And the effects of that are still being felt today. Now, there were codes of conduct before the time of Moses, but they didn't come from religious sources. Uh, Moses is, you know, getting this directly from God himself. There's a, a website 
called the School of the Transfer of Energy. And look that up and you'll see an interesting image if you search around of Moses on the mountain being hidden in the cleft of the rock while the glory of God is radiating from behind. Uh, it's a powerful image. I'd love to have a copy of it, but the artist doesn't have anything like that for sale. But anyway, Moses is on the mountain. And that's the secret to his success. It really is. We have, you can buy whole libraries of books about leadership, and I've read my share. They don't seem to have always helped me as much as I wish they did. But there is no substitute for any leader, spiritual leader, pastor, for spending time alone with God. Moses was called, and God called him up to the mountain, but the secret of Moses' success really was his uh, deliberate efforts to spend time alone seeking God. Even Jesus slipped out and left his disciples and left the crowds. He wanted him. You know, they always wanted healing and a touch, and it's very understandable that they did. But there were times when Jesus was completely unavailable to the crowds and sometimes even from his own inner circle because he had to get alone with his father. These, and they're just as important for you, my friends, my brothers, my sisters, you need to carve into your life times when you go off somewhere and seek God's face. Moses was up on the mountain. He's gone a long time, and they're frightened. These people are, they don't have much depth of character to begin with. And so Moses is gone, and the mountain's still quaking and rocking and rolling, and they're nervous. And finally they come to Aaron after he's been gone longer than they think, and they say they're right in the middle of that verse, come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses, one of the greatest men who ever lived, this fellow Moses, they're disrespectful, who brought us up out of Egypt. Now that phrase will appear several times in this text. Now they're saying Moses brought up out of Egypt. Notice that, don't miss it. We don't know what has happened to him. Verse 2, Aaron answered them. Uh, here's what Aaron should have done. You remember when Moses is called, God says, I want you to go down to Egypt. I want you to tell Pharaoh, the current ruler, I want you to tell him to let my people go. And Moses said, well, Lord, I'm just not, I'm, I'm not good at that sort of thing. I don't speak well. I'm, you know, I'm a very awkward speaker. And, but my brother Aaron, now there is a man with a silver tongue. He would be most persuasive. God never called Aaron. Aaron was a religious professional. He should have never been his, as involved as he was. He, he was a thorn in Moses' side. And what Aaron should have said to these people was, have you people lost your ever-loving minds? Are you crazy? We're right here. Don't you see the cloud? Don't you hear the lightning? And see the lightning and hear the thunder? Aren't you aware that God is up there? Yes, we're here and Moses is up there, but you're... What does this have to do with us, Wingsburg Church of the Nazarene? Oh, nearly everything. <laughs> you know, this has been a tough year. The best year we ever had since I was your pastor and we've had better years before. Matter of fact, um, I was given a church bulletin that goes all the way back to the late 50s, I believe, when this church was running about 240, 60, 70 years ago. I don't know how long ago it was. But the best year we ever had under my pastoral ministry here, we averaged 287. And I told the entire district assembly, we're going over 300 next year. You know, since COVID, we had one Sunday where we had 74 people in the church. Now, you guys, and I, I don't say this in any accusatory way, but you have no idea how demoralizing that is for a preacher. We draw energy from crowds. You can say that's human or fleshly or sinful, but it's just the way it is. And to watch the church implode, a friend of mine in town told my wife not too long ago about the church he attends. He said, I don't know if my church is going to survive. And it's a church with a, a good history here. We're not good at waiting. <laughs> and I know, and I'm 
I've said this. I, I, I want to be careful. I know that there are reasons for some people to stay home during this time. I, I fully understand that. So I'm not condemning anybody who says, well, I'll watch it on television or on the internet or on the web page or whatever. We're not on TV. If they weren't willing to wait, and Aaron should have told them, wait, you must wait. You must not give in to some scheme to try to manipulate God. Um, in Psalm 27, toward the end of that great verse, which starts out, the Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? It says there at the end of that uh, great psalm, wait, I say, wait upon the Lord. Be strong and take courage and wait upon the Lord. Isaiah spoke to us and said, those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up with wings as eagles. They will run and not be weary. They will walk and not faint. Now, church, I know that not every Sunday does the pastor hit a home run or does the worship music tickle you inside or do you feel like it's just been a great place to be, but there is something to be said. It's a necessity as a Christian for being faithful. And you're not showing up to make me happy, although it does. <laughs> of course it does. But you're showing up because you are committed to a relationship with God. And as long as you think it's safe, and again, maybe you don't, we need to be faithful. And they weren't. And Aaron, a man who, like a lot of preachers, wanted people to like him. He said, take off gold earrings that your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. So the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron, and then four, he took what they handed him, and I don't know how he did this out in the desert. These guys were way more talented than we might think, or more sophisticated. He made it into an idol, cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. Then they said, these are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. Now, was this an image of a false god, or was this an attempt to make an image of the true god? It's an interesting little bit of trivia to me that I really was reacquainted with as I was studying for this. Um, that after, after civil war in, in Israel, after the, the death of Solomon, Rehoboam's on the throne, there's civil war again. There was Rehoboam in the south, Jeroboam in the north, Jeroboam nervous that he won't maintain control of the ten tribes, uh, sets up a place of worship with a golden calf. Now the calf, or the bull, is a, is a symbol in the fertility cults. It's a symbol of power and fertility. And if you've ever been around a bull, you know they are a powerful animal. And it is a symbol of this. But they are saying now, uh, in verse 4 again, first they were saying, Moses, this fellow who brought us up out of Egypt, now they're saying, these are your gods. Elohim, or some version of that, Israel. Right here, this calf brought you up out of Egypt. Now you say, that's ridiculous. Well, what do we worship? What are the golden calves in our lives? What do we worship? You know, there are a lot of people in the world today who are religious, and Americans have had a tendency to be religious, but um, they're not always righteous. And it's not just an Old Testament problem. Listen to this from one of Paul's letters to Timothy. But mark this. There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, Disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Now, don't miss this. You got this list of horrible behaviors and propensities. says this about them, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. These people, he 
he says a little bit further down in the same letter, all, are always learning but never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. I've known people who were very religious. They might watch preachers on TV, but they, they won't keep the Ten Commandments. Maybe that's why we want to manipulate God. We like a little God that we can set on a pedestal. And he's not going to tell us no, ever, because he's incapable. It's just an object. We like God's like that. And so he, he made this calf, and he says, these are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. The next verse, when Aaron saw this, he built an altar. He was encouraged. Oh, man, this is going well. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm going to, I, I may end up being in, I don't know what he was thinking, but his thoughts had been wrong to begin with, and now things are really getting out of control. He built an altar in front of the calf and announced tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. Now this is every liturgical act of an Old Testament worship service. There's the God, there's the altar, uh, there's going to be um, a, a festival, and there will be sacrifices. Verse 6 says... So the next day the people rose up early and sacrificed burnt offerings and presented fellowship offerings. Afterward they set, set, sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. Now the word revelry uh, is not explicit about what it actually means in this translation. But what seems to be happening here. Is the the, you know, the pagan? And I've talked about this before. The pagan religions of that day, all the way up in the New Testament days, often featured sexual activity, including temple prostitutes. It just seemed like somewhere the lust of the people had come to, to the surface, and they party, and it ends up in an orgy. Now it doesn't spell that out clearly. Revelry is kind of a broad term, and you can plug a lot of meaning into. But whatever it was, it was total self-indulgence. It was total self-indulgence. We don't know much about self-denial as Americans. Most of us don't. Some of us do. They got up to indulge in reverie. Let's move to the next verse, please. Then the Lord said to Moses, Moses is up on the mountains. Now, stay with me here. Are you with me? You look like you are, anyway. Go down... Because your people, whose people are they? Your people. These are your people, Moses. Whom you brought up out of Egypt have become corrupt. Most preachers would be trembling in their shoes if God showed up in their study and said, Paul, John, Jim, James, your people. <laughs> he would be saying, uh, Lord, I was just getting ready to write out my resignation today, and I'll be moved out by tomorrow. They're not my people. They have become corrupt. Verse 8. They have been quick to turn away from what I commanded them and have made themselves an idol in the shape of a calf. They have bowed down to it and sacrificed to it and have said, These are your gods, Israel. And again, this phrase shows up. Who brought you up out of Egypt. Verse 9. I have seen these people, the Lord says to Moses, and they are a stiff-necked people. Verse 10. Now leave me alone, so that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them. Very interesting sentence. Then I will make you into a great nation. Get out of my way, Moses. I'm going to kill all these people. And I'll start over with you. And you will be the new Abraham. When they talk about the patriarchs, they'll forget about Genesis 12 and Genesis 17. And they'll think of Moses. I don't know how tempting that was. But here's the greatness of Moses. You know, a lot of pastors, when they get together, not all, but occasionally, they'll They'll talk about their people. And usually it's because they're, they're afraid. I know a pastor who's retired now. He came to church, and every time I would see him, he, he would say in one way or the other, they don't like me. And it was hard. I don't 
don't know if they ever did. I never heard him say it. They liked me. <laughs> he would say, well, we're, we're doing this and that, and things are moving ahead, but a lot of them still don't like me. And I don't know why they didn't. I liked him. I thought he was a, a really good guy and a godly man. But pastors are afraid sometimes when they feel like people don't like them. And if God would show up and say, these are your people and they're a mess and, and I am done with them, but I'll start over with you. You are head and shoulders above the rest of the crowd and I'm willing to begin all over again. But Moses would not hear of it. He said, Lord, why should your anger burn against your people whom you brought out of Egypt? Now, who brought them out of Egypt? Moses, the calf? No. He says, you did with, a power, with great power and a mighty hand. And he's referring to the miracles. The miracles that they performed in this great showdown, not just between Moses and Pharaoh, but between the true and living God and the gods of Egypt. It was a cosmic battle, a cosmic struggle between two opposing powers. And eventually he ended there at the Red Sea where the waters parted. When Moses held out his staff, the Egyptian army followed them in. Moses held out his staff. The waters closed over their ground. You brought them out. You brought them out. You opened the waters of the Red Sea. You brought the plague of darkness. You brought the, the, the scourge of killing the firstborn. You did it, Lord. And why should they say it was with evil intent that the, he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to wipe them off the face of the earth? He intercedes for his people. Sometimes preachers get discouraged and they look at people and they say, she'll never change. And sometimes she never does. <laughs> But he is praying for his people. And he says, turn from your fierce anger. Relent and do not bring disaster on your people. Verse 13, he goes all the way back to Abraham. And he says, remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, to whom you swore by your own self. I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and I will give your descendants all this land I promised them, and it will be their inheritance forever. He says, Lord, remember your promises. You know, a lot of times, especially when you're growing up, I'm, I'm a child of the 1960s, and I don't know that I was involved in everything that happened in the 1960s, but I'm certainly influenced by it. And one of the little catchphrases that was used repeatedly in the 1960s was this, don't trust anyone over 30. Now, some of you are old enough to remember that. Well, I, I, I tried to live by that promise, and I have not trusted myself for almost 40 years now. <laughs> there are lots of times when we are young, we think we know so much better than our parents. They're just such ignorant people. What do they know? They don't really understand how the world works and how the world is changing and how if we would just be allowed to be in charge... <laughs> Things would be better. And I, I sometimes I read what young people say on social media, and I say, give you about 20 years and see just if you really feel this way. I think there's going to be a sobering wake-up call for some, at least. Some people never really get it, but he, he, he doesn't say, okay, Lord, it's a big responsibility, but I think I'm up to it. And if you want to start over with me and have from here on out your people be known as the children of Moses rather than the children of Abraham, I'm fine with that. But he says, don't do it. Don't be angry. Don't let the world mock and make fun and say he brought them out to kill them. Don't do it. Remember the promises you made. You told Abraham, this 75-year-old man who had no children, you said, I'll give you descendants. I'll give you real estate. And I'll use your descendants to bless all the peoples of the earth. Don't go back on your word. Now, I don't know that God ever intended to go back on his word, but he was testing Moses, and Moses passed the test. He passed the test. Verse 14 says this, Then the Lord relented, and the word relent means to have pity or compassion. And he did not bring on his people the 
disaster he had threatened. We may talk a little bit more next week about Moses' intercession, but he stood in between God and these stiff-necked, stubborn people. Now again, you say, that's an old story. It has nothing to do with me. Yes, it does. If we're godly people, we should be the people who intercede. We live in a time when most people have very little interest in things of God. They don't. Sunday morning rolls around. I don't know what they do. You know, I mean, they have maybe a day full of activities, or maybe it's a day for sleeping in, uh, or it's a day for shopping. But they, they don't even think about going to church. And they're skeptical. They've probably been influenced by some of the things that have been said about religion since um, 2001, the, the destruction of the Twin Trade, Trade Center Towers, and maybe other things like the, uh, the murder of people at the Charlie Hebdo, that whole event here in Paris. Um, and, uh, you know, they're, they're just kind of negative on religion in general. And that's the world we're called to try to be salt and light in as best we can. I don't have all the answers and I don't think quickly on my feet. And if you would say I have questions about Christianity, I, I wouldn't necessarily disagree with you on some of them, I'm sure. Are there but I believe that there are there is plenty of evidence that makes the belief in Christianity valid. It may not demand a verdict, as Josh McDowell said a few years ago, but it points to a verdict. And I want my little boys to grow up believing in Jesus and serving him. Because I think it's the only way to really have peace, inner peace, and real purpose in life. I don't have all the answers to all the intellectual questions that have been asked about Christianity over the course of 2,000 years or even in the last 10 or so. But I still believe, and yes, it may be cliche, but I still believe something that Andre Crouch, an old gospel singer been gone forever, said, Jesus is the answer. Now, we struggle with it sometimes. We think, oh, man, I can never, you know, I just don't want to buy into that. I, I don't want to, you know, ruin my Sundays by spending them in church. And, and I've got better things to do with my time. And maybe you really think you do. But there's no way to find what life is all about unless you're living in his will. And our, our temptation is to try to bring God down to our level, to have a God we can manipulate, to have a God who will turn a, uh, turn a blind eye to the things that we do that are wrong, that, that we know are wrong, and still think we're okay with God. Think about it for a moment. Not one adult that walked out of Egypt made it into the promised land. Their children did, but they did not. Their lack of faithfulness kept them from enjoying the very reason God brought them out. Uh, somewhere in uh, one of the early 90th Psalms, God says, I put up with those, and this is my rough paraphrase, I put up with those people for 40 years, and they never did get it right. And so I said, they'll never enter my rest. They never will. Now why? It's because God is mean? Here's my understanding of the wrath of God. And I, I believe it, our understanding has, has grown. Um, I believe that when you want to know what God is like, you look to Jesus. Who is God? What is he like? Look to Jesus. There you'll see it. And I believe that I, the best understanding I have of the wrath or anger of God is found in Romans chapter 1 when it says, because people held on to their sins and would not let them go, he gave them over. He gave them over. 
sort of like all the way back in Egypt. They worshiped frogs. God said, you want frogs? You can have frogs. I'll give you all the frogs you want. If I had everything I'd ever wanted, where would I be today? In a bad place. No question about it. Well, are we willing to wait and be faithful? Are we willing to wait and be faithful? When God is somewhere else, it seems to us, and maybe even the leader that we have depended on Maybe I shouldn't share this story, but I will. Uh, my brother, Jim, moved to Atlanta in 1983 and started going to the First Nazarene Church there and played the organ for a while and was really a part of the church. And for reasons that had nothing to do with doctrine, felt like he could not attend there anymore. He wasn't mad at the Church of the Nazarene, um, but he had some issues that just made it almost, in his mind, impossible. So he had a roommate that was attending First Baptist of Atlanta. And uh, so he went there. He sat under Charles Stanley's preaching for several years. Most of you know that Dr. Stanley got a divorce, and it tore that church apart. Jim was in a Sunday school class. It was a large class. That class was probably bigger than some churches, many churches. And that class dissolved. And there was a parting of the ways, and Andy went off and started his own thing, and there was tremendous tension between father and son. Now, the church survived, and Dr. Stanley just retired at age 174, I believe. <laughs> um, but sometimes your leadership will, not intentionally, but they'll fail you. And all of a sudden, this person that you thought, was a great leader, and he was. I don't care what you think about his Baptist doctrine. He was a great preacher and a great leader. But everything crumbles. Then what do you do? What do you do when you're the, the Sunday school class that's been your identity in a big church that runs several thousand people just dissolves and there's nobody there? What do you do? Stay with it. We're going to wait. If Moses never comes off the mountain, we're going to wait. And that's what Aaron should have told him. He'll be back. Wait on him. Wait on him. Church, I hope that for the sake of your children and your grandchildren, you will be determined to be faithful. Well, I wonder if there's anyone today who would like to come and pray. I'm going to open the altar, and I'm not going to linger. It's a little bit early, but I am going to give you a chance. If anybody wants to come and pray this morning. Um, there's a chorus that's pretty old as far as choruses goes. I'm going to sing it. If you know it, sing along. If you don't listen, I'm going to ask you to stand. Change my heart, oh God. Change 
Maybe it's not necessarily anything evil, but it's a substitute for you, and there really is no substitute. There are no substitutes for you. Bless and keep us. Go with us. Help those who have raised their hands. Oh, God, you are faithful. You are faithful, and you are always faithful. The scripture says in one place, if we deny you, you will deny us. But it also says in the very next verse, if we are faithless, you will remain faithful, because it's who you are. And let these precious, precious people know that you love them today. And we pray this.